Hello, and welcome to Zim Explorer. I am Dr. Abstract, in my best television personality voice. <laughs> uh, welcome back to Zim Explorer, and today we're going to take a look at Grava. Cool, huh? So Grava instructs you, Gravbot, you're a Gravbot, to clear a path. That's rather mysterious. So we click on it, and here it is, and we need to clear a path. All right, well, uh, to do that, you swipe these things either left or right. And, uh, well, I don't know, I was swiping. Do you see that? I was swiping, and then, what? It's giving me this ring thing. Why is it giving me a ring? Uh, but it doesn't do it over here. Hmm. So uh, you have to kind of figure out, ah, it's this, this line right here seems to be the path, and no other line is the path. All right, well, path is cleared, but have a look. If we go off to the right here, there's more of them, and where's the path? Uh, here's the path on this one. So the problem is that sometimes if you were to clear a path like this way, and then we go back and look at our, our previous page, Hey, wait a minute, our path got, I, I don't want that, I want the, I want this to be clear. And then you come back over to this page, and hey, so it's like a battle of trying to organize how you can fill in these little spaces every everywhere so that you can actually clear a path. And there's more pages as well. And it's multi-user. So that means if, uh, like, it might, it's actually not too hard yourself <laughs> clearing the path because you can sort of carefully go, oh, that's strange. This time, this line here is the path, but actually it doesn't go all the way. So where does it go? It goes to here. So this is the path. This is also the path. So it's um, a slightly different path this time. Whoa, and look at that, these ones go right across, so even though there's more than one page, this whole line is all filled. So let's go to the next page to the right. This is the top line we're looking at. It's full all the way across these three pages. You see that? So that's why it does that. Whereas if we did this, uh, and then did it, it, it sort of does it, because it's full in all the other ones, but if we go over here now, and swipe to the left, you see this part doesn't move because all these guys are filling in the spaces here. Anyway, the specific pattern doesn't doesn't mean anything. We kind of thought, hey, maybe we could, if, if you swipe on a single, maybe it goes single. This would also be a single, this one right here. And if you swipe on a double, maybe it goes twice. But I think that would have made it a little bit too difficult to, to manage and it would have been a neat though if you swipe on this one which is like nothing there's no circle in it then maybe it wouldn't move at all so who knows maybe that could be if this all works out people really like it maybe that could be an advanced version or something but right now I think it's going to be hard enough to clear a path um, with uh, multi players. Now let's check out that multi-user thing. So I'm going to drop down to an F11 here and we'll copy this into a new browser window. Like that. Well, almost a new browser window. So this is Grava and if you take a look here, oh, hang on. I'll bring it back, I promise. So now we've got two versions of it here, and as I move these ones, the top ones move like that. <laughs> <They didn't. laughs> as I move those ones, the top ones don't. Oh, what's going on with my multi-user? F11 here. Oh, F12, sorry. Getting some sort of error. No error. There's a spinning on a controller. Um, that's no problem. Uh, as far as I know, this was working before. Let's try it again. Oh, are we on a different page? We're on a different page. Okay. So um, this one, uh, which one did we just come in on? I don't know. This, anyway, let's go to the front. This is the the top left page. You can tell from the uh, little arrows. There's no arrows going up or to the up or to the left there. So if we come on here, this is the top left page, and sure enough, uh, if we move this. 
there they, they move there. So this is multi-user that's going to a server, I don't know, somewhere in South America <laughs> and back, <laughs> who knows. And we can see that we're moving uh, multi-user together. Okay. Um, alrighty. So why don't we'll, we'll just go back to the, the one view now and let's have a look through the code, shall we? All right. Boop. Here's Grava. We're bringing in CreateJS and Zim 10.7.1. Although this multi-user stuff, uh, multi-user is the primary thing I suppose we'd want to explore uh, in this case, although it is a rather more complicated version of, you know, we could look at a more simple multi-user, uh, but it's not too bad. Um, multi-user has been around for a long time, so even way back in Zim 2 and 3, it was one of the first sort of uh, helper modules that we put in place in Zim. Here it is right here, a Zim socket right there. We're uh, bringing in also socket I.O. So the Zim socket is based on socket I.O., and there's also a Zim server side that you would set up. Right now that's on Amazon. We're trying to bring it locally because it's not, if you notice here, oh, it doesn't matter here, I guess. But um, when we connect to the server, uh, which is done through the Zim server URLs, let's have a look here. We, we take that, we copy it, and go back to a browser, browser, open up a new tab and paste it in. Uh, Zim server is currently on Amazon EC2, and the thing is, is if we ever change uh, servers, uh, socket server locations, uh, all of the old things, all, all of the things that have been made would then break. So what we're encouraging is never hard code this address in there. That's an IP address. What we found is EC2 would close down or change uh, IP addresses. And then we start it up again and be a different IP address. Uh, and then all the old socket code was broken. We'd have to go back and fix that. So instead, we're bringing in this URL. And note that URL right there is not a secure URL. It would mean we'd have to pay for secure um, certificates on Amazon as well as our own server, which we didn't want to do. So we're trying to bring that into our own server where it will be HTTPS, uh, but we're just having a snag on some cores issue there. It's been like 50 emails back and forth, but we're trying to get that. Uh, anyway, good. So we currently supply, like uh, if you want, you can come in and sort of join that thing. Just go to zimjazz.com under code, look up sockets, uh, and you'll find a place where you can request to get one of these things right down here. Well, uh, I'll show you. It's in the model. Mm. Some socket right there, it, an app name. And if you get an app name, then you can use the Zim socket server on Amazon. Because we're like paying 20 bucks a month or something like that, and we're hardly using it, you know. So uh, as long as you're not having millions of connections or something, like that, <laughs> we're happy to help you out for now. <laughs> Um, so if you like this multi-user thing, of course, go see ZimSocket. Uh, perhaps I'll just quickly show you where that is located. You go to Zim. Under the code, there's, if you scroll on down, there's helper libraries. So past these guys, there they are right there. So these are the libraries of Zim. ZimSocket is listed there, along with game, physics, 3JS, and the pizzazz things. So if you click on sockets, this itself is a socket, so or as a, as a multi-user. So if I were to copy this into another page here, um, that's already highlighted. So bring this back. Sockets are so cool, uh, except I, I'm used to <laughs> multiple monitors here. So if I if I select something here, like these words, Look, there they are selecting on the on the other one. Isn't that neat? So if you were to come and join me, you'd get a different color and you could select words as well. So if I select these words there, and there's a few different examples of sockets on here, an avatar, a chat, a collective coloring app. Uh, this was you rebuild a diagram collectively and this was like a remote control thing. So um, you come on into ZimSocket then, and there's a little bit about it. 
And there's also a place right here. Uh, there's the Zoom socket, socket server. There's somewhere where we can request. Do you see a request anywhere? There it is right there, request. So when you hit request, you can pass in a name and email, and an app name, and send the request and uh, some more information about it. And you can set up your own sockets. I think the last time I did that actually it just gave me back a blank a blank page so maybe there's something it's still all working but the response you'll get from that is blank page which <laughs> you know we haven't looked at it in four years so maybe something happened I don't know uh, anyway perhaps it wasn't using <laughs> perhaps it wasn't using those special URLs here maybe it was still hard coded with some old one Alrighty, anyway, uh, back to it here. How's this explorer going for you? Welcome to Zim Explore. Ba -ba 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 -ba. Oh, we need the sound, don't we, for that to, to work properly. Whatever. All right, so we've been jumping around a bit. Let's uh, carry on, though. So here uh, are, we're calling the socket URLs to make sure that we get the latest socket. Uh, address and stuff and there we are bringing in our helper Zim class. We're also using, which is perhaps part of this explorer, a model view controller and that can be found in Zim under MVC. So going back to the Zim site here. Badoop again under code. If we scroll on down under help, nope, under tools right here under tools, you've got MVC. Try out Zim MVC in tools. Yeah, there might be other ways to go there. Why is this all so big and so small at the same time? All right. Um, so model view controller is a way that you can organize or split your code into three uh, different JavaScript files, model view and controller. And then, hey, this is uh, Zim model view controller is very, very simple. There it is. Uh, the model is equal to you call the model. Then the view is equal to and you pass the model into the view. And then the controller is equal to a new controller and you pass the model and the view into the controller. Nice, huh? Now we've seen some model view controller systems that are just like oh, unbelievably complex. And it's just like, no, nah, okay, it doesn't have to be that complex. <laughs> All right, so... Um, the model view, if you go in, you can find out a simple version and a, co a complex version just means we're doing more things in there and sending things back and forth. And uh, But anyway, the simple version is, um, you know, probably good enough to start for you guys. So reducing this down, uh, we're, we import then the model view and the controller from the scripts page. And we have these open up top here as well. So we'll, we'll be going through those. And that's kind of a nice thing. Our main code right here is, there it is. Now we've adjusted it slightly because the model doesn't happen right away. So what we've done is we've made the model call back this arrow function right here. Okay, so when the model is ready, it will call back this arrow function, at which point it uh, makes a view and passes the model to the view, and then it makes a controller and passes the model and the view to the controller. The controller is the sort of the events to when things happen, it updates the model or changes the view, or when we change the view, it updates the model, etc. Model changes, blah, blah, blah. So this is basically where all our uh, events are happening. The model is our data, where we're getting our data from. So with multi-user, the data is coming from a socket. So we, we set up the socket and stuff. It could come from a database, could come from local storage. Um, so that's your data. It's the model. Sort of a strange word for it, but we're modeling life. So we get the data. What is the data? And then we'll, we'll create a view of that model, of that data. And so the view is what we can see. So all those circles are stored in the view. And then, all, like I said, all of our events are here. Now, this one's a little bit different. Uh, here's another thing that we can explore. Let's take a look at that, uh, the app itself. You see all these things here? Those are circles. 
and they're made from circles within circles and part circles and stuff like that. There's a lot of vectors going on here. That's, uh, you know, we're talking a thousand vectors or something. And to, to animate or indeed even drag this thing, if we were updating the stage for all of those vectors, it would be a little boggy. Like this, you would see, it would look like this kind of thing uh, 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 as you drag, whereas this is fairly smooth. Now, I'm not sure exactly how it's going to show up on, on the video of this because that adds an extra layer of, of delay and stuff, but it looks smooth here when I'm, you know, when I'm looking at it. So what we've done is we've said, okay, uh, we could cache these. If we cache each one of these, that means it turns it into a bitmap, and that means the GPU can process it. If we cache it, it will be you know relatively fast. It's still a whole bunch of bitmaps. You know, we're talking a hundred or more bitmaps, uh, but that's manageable. Um, however, the quality suffers just a little. It becomes a bit fuzzy, a little bit um, a little bit soft around the edges. So what we're going to do here is the background there, or all, all of these little round things, they're on uh, one frame or on one stage. So whenever we build them or show, you know, need to show them, we update it once and there they are. Uh, but we don't update them as we drag this because this interface, the nav here, is on a different frame. It's on a different stage. So as we drag this, this stage is being updated, but the backing stage is not being updated. Isn't that neat? Um, now, uh, we did the same thing with the animating. If we were trying to animate these as they all little rotate and stuff like that, if we tried to animate them, as they animate it, they would have to update all the other ones. So instead, what we're doing is, as we as we move it here, uh, we're drawing a rectangle that covers the uh, the bottom stage. So the rectangle, if we know we're going to move uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, uh, as we move the seven, I got to also draw a rectangle over here. It, was, it wasn't terribly easy um, to do this, but say I'm just moving those four, we draw a rectangle, and then we would draw copies of the one, two, three, four on the stage above, so on the same nav stage here, and we animate those. So really, we're only animating a smaller number. When we animate, we actually do cache them so that the animation is a bit smoother on mobile. Uh, and because they're animating, even though they're blurry, you can't really tell. Hey, maybe even the blur is good. Like, oh, motion blur. Oh, shush, look at those go. I she could have applied some effects like that, I suppose, to you know, have fun. At least we rotated them. Uh, initially, we were just sliding them, but we kind of liked the, the looks of them rotating. <laughs> it's kind of neat. Um, so that's the uh, the way that we laid that out. And the coding in behind that was quite complicated to calculate. Uh, we're, it's all based on data as well. We can't We can't just animate these things. We have to remember the data and send that data across the, the sockets or across the multi-user so that the other people also see those moving, at which point um, they get animated on the other screens. Now, the way we've set that up, we're not going to go through it in this Explorer if you're going, oh my goodness, that sounds like, oh, we're going to be here for hours. Yeah, we probably would be. Um, if uh, The way we did that, though, is this screen is just one of the pages. This is another page. And you know, as, as we move things here, you see how they go off the page? We need to know that they're uh, moving in this data as well. So we had to look at the whole grid. It's a nine, nine page grid. We had to look at the whole grid so that things could wrap around the grid. That was a, a design choice to sort of help out with the gameplay. If, if this was the last page, you see how we can't, we can't go that way, we can only go this way. If this is the last page, if I were to swipe that way, we could have made it so that they just don't swipe. Like we would go, uh, I'm swiping, but it's pushing against the edge. Uh, by the way, do you see, I don't know, uh, it doesn't do it on nothing. Um, if, you, if you swipe really, <laughs> if you try and swipe quickly, it takes 200 milliseconds for these to animate. 
but uh, if somebody else is animating already or if you're swipe if you swipe really quickly I, I can't yeah there we go you see how it went red red was um, uh, there meaning that whoa 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 uh, we're still moving so with multi-user we have to be careful about that we don't want to change data when somebody else was already changing data and, and their data might overwrite ours or ours might overwrite theirs so we need to lock the the change um, so as that as that animates during that time multi-user other players can't move um, there's different ways to deal with that with the 200 millisecond issue it's it's not really that much of a problem you know it's going to lock temporarily it'll go red and you just try again after the red goes away you know that that kind of thing so blah 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 we're talking 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 um the, oh uh we have nine of these pages with data what we had to do or what would be the most efficient way to do that is work out a way that we can say hey all the pages are going to work the same way and if a if a, a pattern is moving, if we're if we're going to the next to the next page, then that's just treated like, hey, I just swipe the first one on the next page. Um, and so basically, we have a recursive function. The function says, oh, if I swipe here, but if I'm going off the page, and I'll call the function again on the next page. And so the same code runs the next page. And if that continues on to the page after or wraps around then so be it it wraps around and it calls the next function on the wrapped page so is that neat uh, then the only difference really is is what page are we viewing if we're not viewing the page we don't need to do the animation but if we are viewing the page if it's a page that's currently active then uh, we have to do the animation so this one function handles it for not only all pages but all pages on everybody else's as well. Because on my page, maybe it's animating. And on somebody else's page, maybe it's not. Or but maybe the next page is animating. Anyway, uh, that's the overall uh, overview. <laughs> the overall <laughs> overview of it. OK, so like I said, we're not actually going to go into that code. What I wanted to do is uh, in this explore is show you uh, the MVC, Model View Controller, but also how we can implement the socket stuff. Okay, so here's a bit of the MVC stuff. Here's the other frame that we've made. And uh, not much else there. We, we brought in the font at that point too because it's part of the navigation. So this is the second frame. Uh, now all of this stuff when we get into these, unless we pass the stage or the frame into them, these remote pages, model view and controller, aren't going to know what uh, what the stage is or what the second stage is. Stage nav, it's called. So do you see how we've done it there? We did not declare stage nav there, nor did we declare stage here or stage width and stage height even. We declared them all outside. So these are global. They're right in the script, which means once we call these guys, the model view controller, they will have access to all this stuff because we've made them global. Okay, so both frames, the frame and the frame nav, both stages, the stage and the stage nav, that's the top stage. And then the stage width and stage height is the same for both of them. So we declare them up there, great, then we fill them out here, we call these guys, let's have a look at the model then. Here's the model. Now this is called the module pattern, it's more like an ES5 or a JavaScript 5 module pattern. And right down at the bottom, that's uh, returning the, uh, the app, but if we didn't have an app, so if the app exists, we pass, or it doesn't actually return the app there, it does there. Uh, if the app exists, we pass it in here, and then if it doesn't exist, we pass in an empty object up here at the top. Bop, 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 bop. This is the app. So at the moment, the app doesn't exist. This is the model, so this is the first time the app is being called. So it's calling this function and assigning it to the app. So down there at the very bottom, whoop, it doesn't exist yet. 
So therefore, an empty one is being passed in to that note that we're, uh, it's a self-calling function. So this is the end of the function, and we're saying, run that function. <laughs> you can do that. Isn't that neat? Uh, and so we receive an empty model, or sorry, an empty app there. Uh, it's an <laughs> empty object. <laughs> we receive it as app. We put the model class on that. So here's a class that's a function. So that's, again, an ES5 function. Uh, at the end of it here, we return the app. The reason why we return the app, is the app is, isn't this fun? What an exploration. The app is this, because we passed it into it. We saved it as app, and we return the app. And when we return the app, it goes, it's the return of this function, goes into that app right there. So after we run the model, the app now exists. <laughs> it's like some tongue twister. When we go to the view and call the view, um, we say, hey, run this function and assign the results of this function to app. Well, when we, uh, when we do this function, we're running it because of these round brackets, it's asking, does app exist? Well, it does exist. It's the app object from the model. So the app object from the model gets passed in there. Ooh, the app object from the model gets passed in. It gets collected here. We add the view to that app model. Well, it's not to the app model, to the app, like the app from the model thing. The app from the model thing is just like a, an object literal with a model in it. Now the app is an object literal with the model in it and the view in it. Okay. Uh, when we're done that, we return the app. This app now has the model and the view. When we return the app, it goes into this app right here. So now app has been overwritten with an, uh, an object literal that has both the model and the view. When we run the controller, <laughs> the controller is here. The controller says, yeah, an app already exists, so we'll pass that in. The app with the model and the view exists. We collect it here, which is right here. We add the controller to it. So now the object literal has a model, a view, and a controller. And we return that. We return that app to this app right here. So by the time these three things are imported back here in the index, we import them. Import, import, import. Right now, after we've imported these, we now have um, an app variable, a global app variable, that has a model class, a view class, and a controller class. So that when we come to our script right here, boop, 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 we ask for a new app model. Well, that makes a, an object from the model class that's stored in app. When that's loaded, uh, it does a callback, and we make a new app view because view exists on app, and we also make a new app controller because controller exists on app. All right, you may have to play that back in slow speed. I don't know. That is the module pattern. Now, one of the issues with the module pattern is it might make a diff. Well, it actually doesn't make a difference which order we run this in. We could, we could add these in any order, which is cool. So, uh, great. Um, there's an ES6 module pattern as well, but it's not supported all by all things. For instance, we just used it, and then we put our stuff on an iPad, and it didn't work. And we're going, why didn't it work? Why didn't it work? Oh, right, yeah, because a bit of Safari on, on um, iOS doesn't uh, support the um, importing, ES6 importing uh, modules. So that means you have to... Uh, put it through Babel or something like that. So we put it through Babel and then found out it needed require. And so we tried to import require, but require is like more of a node node thing, I think. I don't know. It's like we're crying out loud. And it's like putting all this code in there. It's just like, what? I'm not even going to bother. So I'm not going to bother. This works just fine. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> you know, I, 
Um, the other thing with ES6, I, you know, <laughs> something like exploring and having a grape, a grape fest. The other thing with uh, ES6 modules is you can e you can either specify specifically which classes you want to um, import, or uh, yeah, I guess import, or you can. And in that in that case, you can use those those classes or those uh, whatever properties, probably classes, um, functions. You can use those directly without a namespace. But if you want to bring in all of the the classes, then the only way to do it with ES6 modules is to well you either can list them all, which is ridiculous, or you can um, use a namespace. Okay. Uh, with Zim, we've got hundreds of these things. We obviously don't want to I, I don't want to force people to list everything they're going to use in Zim. That's like just not, that's silly. So we're stuck with a namespace and we don't want a namespace. We want them all global. Thank you very much. So sorry. You know, I mean, some people might want a namespace, in which case Zim provides that namespace. But really, it's uh, it's a broken system. You know, come on. Let us choose. If I want to bring them all in globally, let me bring them all in globally. You know, don't don't be petty. Don't try and enforce something on us that we don't want. <laughs> so I really don't like the new ES6 modules, and I'm not I'm not going to use them. Uh, and and we don't. Um, anyway, like I said, didn't mean to get into a grape face fest. Obviously, I'm passionate about it, huh? Okay, <laughs> I have a feeling people are going to just stop watching this now. I'm, I'm too grouchy for them. So let's try and not be grouchy, and uh, we'll bring it back to um, happiness here. Yes? Oh, there we go. Peaceful exploration. Ah, oh, yes. Okay, yeah, let's bring it back now, huh? <laughs> Okay, so let's go to the model and see what's in the model. This is like, think of this as part two. Ah, the happy part two. Actually, probably should be a part two, shouldn't it? Uh, whatever, it's an explorer, so we can go a little bit longer. As long as we keep the explorers to under an hour. So here's our uh, model, and what are we doing? One thing that we do is this is a class, so we're bringing this in as a class. <laughs> we could use an ES6 class. But ES6 classes do not have private variables or private properties. So you couldn't make a page number here and then use that page number inside of uh, this get data method. So we've got get data, set method, and set data. And you see how, I don't know, do we are we using a page here? Now we're passing in only parameters. Sometimes we might want to use a private variable that comes from outside here. Well, in ES6 classes, we don't have that. You can only, the only way to access a variable uh, from another method, or from the constructor, is to store it on the class itself. Uh, there's these other things called symbols, but that seems like a complicated way of doing it. So uh, until ES6 comes up with uh, private variables, I don't even know if I'm going to use the ES6 class. I mean, maybe for simple things, the, the format of it is easier. But really, the format of this isn't all that hard. <laughs> I think it's actually possibly easier. It's just a function. That's it. We, we have no constructor. We got no, you know, nothing else we have to deal with. ES6, yeah, great. You get to use the class keyword, but you know, then you got to remember a format for a constructor and a few other things that are a little bit annoying. Anyway, um, right, so a page number. Which page are we on? We're storing that here on the model. So we could store it on this. So anywhere we use this, this would be like saying the model, when we make a new model object, this is that object. And therefore, that model will have a page number. Uh, but rather than use this all throughout here, we've just stored this in a constant called m. So anywhere we use m, that's referring to our model. So uh, we don't even have to do this necessarily unless the view or the controller 
need to know what this page num is. Okay. Um, so anything that somewhere else needs to, to use, we would store it on our M. Now it's a bit of a pain to use m.pagenum. Uh, we're gonna through throughout here we use the page num, or we may or may not. Um, so it's a bit of a pain to use m.pagenum, so we've also stored a local variable called page num. That actually probably could be a let, I think. All right, so uh, unless we declare it again somewhere else. Uh, I, I, anyway, not sure why we used farther. So we also have a socket URL that we're storing in server. This is given to us by uh, this guy right here. Work, 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 work. Zim socket, uh, Zim server URLs. So if uh, you recall when we looked at the server URLs before, where was that? Not here. Let's close that one down. Uh, here. There it is, var Zim socket URL. So it's a server domain plus a port. Let's port. And here we are setting up the socket. So we have uh, the server. We also requested to, to get a uh, an ID there, an app ID. So that's an app name. Uh, the way this works is if, if you were to use Grava3, then you would intercept our data um, and things would conflict. Uh, the socket then is a new Zim socket. Now note we're using the namespace there. Uh, the socket was one of the earlier things made, and I don't think we went back to it and turned off the Zim namespace. That might be something. Or this is something that we did with the game library and the physics library and the, and the 3JS library, but I don't think we did it yet with the socket. So we may do that in the future where you won't need the, the namespace there. And we're passing it the server and the app name. This sets up our socket. We'll need to access the socket later, like in our controller when we're operating on things, we might want to send data. The controller could request from the model to send that data, and indeed we do some of that, but there's just some areas where it's nice to go right to the socket. So if the controller or the view, I can't remember which one, is using the socket, then we'll want to store that on the model because remember in, in the view, we actually receive the model uh, as M. And so that's what we're doing. You see in the view here, we're receiving the model as M. So we continue to use M for the model and we've got uh, the view stored on V. So here we are accessing the M stuff. And then when we make some things, if we ever need those to be referenced elsewhere, like these patterns, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, are referenced elsewhere. So we store them on the view directly, view.patterns. You get it? And then over in the controller, we're accessing some things from the model, M, and some things from the view, V. And so we consistently are using M for the model, V for the view. Uh, the controller is kind of the last step, so we don't really need to store any C's for the controllers because the other ones don't model in the view don't have access to the controller. The controller has access to the model in the view but not vice versa. Alright so back in the model we've made our socket. We are starting off with some empty data and, and then when the socket is ready we check to see basically what we're doing is if we've got so the uh, well, okay, with the socket is ready, we may as well go through each one. We're collecting a master time because there we need we need a time uh, just to sort of check uh, that nobody else is swiping. The issue is, is if somebody leaves while they're swipe, like they're swiping, it's animating, and they leave. We could capture an event to find out if they've left, but uh, sometimes that doesn't work so well. There. There is an event in JavaScript where if you close your browser, that event is supposed to fire, but on all platforms, it doesn't necessarily fire, so you can't totally rely on it. So what we've done is we 
uh, when somebody swipes, there's a time that is set. And if later p other people are, because that locks it. If other people are then trying to swipe and it's locked, imagine if it's locked forever, it's locked. So now what we do is we use this master time. That's the, uh, a way to compare to find out if, if it's been open too long, like longer than 200 seconds, milliseconds, sorry, milliseconds, then uh, don't worry, it's not really locked. It's just accidentally locked or <laughs> broken. It's a fail safe in a sense, and that's what we're using the sockets master time for, uh, along with some other things at that point. Here we are using Zim sockets get latest value for tile data, and that's really handy. This gets Whoever sent their tile data last, this gets the last tile data that was sent. It's handy for uh, if you're sharing information, like say a shared cursor. Where should the cursor be? And everybody's moving the cursor. Whoever moved it last, that's where the cursor should be. This is the type of thing that get latest value can do. So once somebody changes the tile data, this will get that. Now, if there isn't any, it doesn't exist. So we're saying, hey, if there is tile data, then do this. Else, we're going to um, make new data. So busy check false. OK, so I don't know what the busy check. We'll come back to that maybe. Anyway, we're going to make the new data. And the function to make the new data is right here. It basically picks from our um, data.push random nine pick. Lovely. Uh, we're making nine pages. So that's nine pages of, of data. Uh, rows times calls. So like if we have a certain number of rows and a certain number of calls, I think it's like 16 across and nine down or something like that. Uh, times nine times. So this is making all of the data and we're pushing uh, ran one of the patterns. So ran nine, zero to nine or zero to eight, that would be one of the patterns. So those little round circles, there's 10 of them, 0 to 9 we're choosing. And then we're also choosing an orientation. Note how we're using Zim pick there. So that's Zim pick. Zim pick has a choose and we can pass in any pick literal. So this will randomly pick from that array. We could pass in a series and then Zim pick dot choose would um, pick from the next thing in the series. Uh, we can also pass in a min and a max object, and zim pick would then choose from the min and the max object. This is what we use in behind the scene in zim. Whenever you pass in a zim v value, it's called uh, for a random, or well, not necessarily random, some something that you need to pick from, either pick randomly or from a series or from a function. We use this in zim in behind. That's a zim pick object. So this makes us a whole bunch of patterns. And then we're looping through, oh, I shouldn't even tell you this. This is the secret stuff to make the path. So I'm not going to talk too much about the path. <laughs> and then we're shuffling the data. So the data is is created there. Why do we even bother the, ah, right, OK, I know. Um, initially, we made some, some initial data. Uh, I don't even think we need to shuffle the data because we just randomly went through it all. Oh no, I I see what we're doing. This is how many how many spaces we're going to need. Okay, so it's not setting the path directly, but rather it's setting the the, the path gets set directly down here. Um, we're just creating the correct number of spaces, and then we're shuffling the data, which is the spaces. Okay, right, yeah, so we made a whole bunch of patterns and we overwrote a bunch of spaces and then we shuffle it all so that those spaces appear in different places. Great. And we set the property on on the socket. So socket.set property tile data. In other words, we're the first people here. And we just set the tile data and passed it this data um, array. So this is the array of all of that stuff. And note that we don't actually keep, of course, we don't keep those images. We're not sending back and forth the images. We're just sending back data for them. So that's the data is 0 to 9. Actually, can show you the data if you want. We, we made a hard-coded set as we were building. We made a hard-coded set of data so that we could test things. Like as we were shifting, these, shifting the, the columns and the rows, uh, it helped to have a 
the same data all the time so that we could practice things and not have it random. So we just out output uh, that data into this. And here's roughly what that looked like. So this means uh, pattern number nine rotated zero. This means show a space. Pattern number nine rotated zero. Pattern number zero rotated 90. Pattern number zero rotated zero. Pattern number five rotated 90, etc. spaces. And this is one row. This is another row, another row, another row. So this is all one page. And this is second page. That's one row, another row. And then after that, we didn't really need, oh, I guess we did two pages. After that, we just didn't care. And so um, this was our, our data set that we were working with. And if we wanted to, you know, make sure it worked with two spaces in a row, then we, we'd come in here and adjust the data to be two spaces in a row. All right. This is the data that is getting sent across the socket anytime data updates. Now, it might be more efficient, possibly. That doesn't really happen all that often, though. It's just like when somebody moves, we pass it. It's not like it's happening all the time. It only happens when somebody moves, and that's no big deal. If this were if this were data that was like constantly being sent across a socket at the speed of a mouse move or something like that, which sometimes you need data like that. Like if I'm if I'm dragging something, we constantly are sending x and y. Obviously, we would not want to send all this data um, across constantly. At that point, we would have to sort of say, oh, well, okay, all of it stayed the same except for these ones which were changed. So let's only send the ones that were changed, and you would have to store some master version where... Um, <laughs> anyway, so uh, which you can do as well. You could the first person there could store the master, and from then on, nobody really changes the master. That's done. Um, that's you would only send a certain amount of data, kind of deal. Alrighty, back to the model then. So we've seen a couple things with the socket. One is get latest value. There's also a, uh, you can get certain people's values, like other people that are in the quote room. You can get individual values. Now, just a word of warning there. As a matter of fact, I think we had um, the docs wrong. Uh, that reminds me, you got to go and change those docs. The docs wrong. Get latest value does not include your your data. Uh, that was a design a design decision. Should we include your own data or not? Uh, it was decided that uh, when we get latest value that it's only other people's latest value. You should know your own value. Uh, <laughs> you kind of talk to yourself when you work with sockets. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> you imagine you as one of the sockets and the other people as another socket. The tricky thing is it's all the same code. <laughs> So uh, it just depends on you know who, who's running it, but it's a tricky thing. You, you're dealing with multiple people, but all with the same code. So you are yourself, but you're also the other people. Um, anyway, uh, something like that. So we've seen the get latest data there. We also saw a set property, although we looked at it down here with the set property, the tile data. What are we doing here? A busy check. If we're arriving and there's no data, we're going to set. Oh yeah, okay. So if we're the first person in here, no, this this is the first person in. If we're arriving, why do we set a busy check to false? Well, that would mean I'm not busy. Yeah, I guess uh, my busy check is false. Oh, make do need No, this is the first person. Yeah, sorry. Uh, that Okay, this makes sense. This is first person. Make data is the, we're the first person in the, in the room, so to speak. First person to be playing the app at, at the moment. Um, by the way, if everybody... So as, as you're playing, the socket stays open as long as your browser is open. But if everybody's gone, then it sort of restarts. The next person who comes in is going to be a whole new, a whole new game, so to speak this make data gets done. We also set a busy check to false. So we have not, nobody is swiping at the moment, obviously. Okay, great. Um, 
any more data. We're making data. I won't bother talking about that. Here's a, a method called get data, a method called set data, and a method called get path data. So these methods need to be available outside. So this is what the, the controller or the view possibly will use. They will get the data and set the data at various times. And here is what we do when uh, that happens. That's us adjusting, adjusting the array. It's calling a, a, a private function, or some people call it a private method there. Adjust page is only available uh, here. We can't, we can't operate on adjust page from view and controller. Only things within the model can call adjust page. See, there it is. It's just a local function. But these, these methods, which are public, um, allow you know allow, carefully allows you to adjust the page through the methods. They're only allowing certain things and returning certain things. And then this is the the various stuff that we're doing when we go from page to page, I guess. <laughs> so there you go. That's um, the model. Woot woot, how we doing? We're looking at uh, 50 minutes here, and uh, it's hard to say if you'll still be with me. I'll close that down. Here's the view. Hopefully you are. If you are, um, hello. I'm glad glad you're here. Uh, please join us at zimjs.com slash slack, where we can talk about all this stuff if you want. Uh, you're welcome to say, hey, in that video, uh, you know, uh, you know, I can help you out if there's anything you don't understand. All right, so this is the view. How much of it do we need to get into the view? Uh, basically, these are all of the stuff where we made a certain circle. And this is type four. So this is number four, number three, number two, etc. Nice easy one. This is just a container with a circle there and a circle there. And uh, I guess another circle there. Neat, huh? And this was fun to make. They were like little puzzles. Basically, what we're doing there is making these things. Making that. <laughs> that one's easy. It's an outer circle with a circle just off to the right. That one's not too bad. Uh, by the way, we've got a percent now on circles. So that's a percent 50. And then we rotate it and stick it in the container along with that. Oh, look at that one, making that one. So that was fun. Like, pro Programming is such a, a great puzzle, isn't it? And this was us working on the puzzle. Choom, choom, choom. All right. Um, then we've got a function that is going to make a pattern. Oh, that's so cool. We just did a tile. Look at this. Uh, sorry, I'll try and not say the word just. Yeah, I hate that because <laughs> you sort of look at it and go, well, that's not just. Look at all that stuff. I have no idea what that means. What do you mean by just? Uh, you made it sound easy. <laughs> well, <laughs> okay. Uh, whenever we make the tile, we remove the old tile. We start with a new tile number. And then we say make tile. And each time we make the tile, the object that we're going to use comes from make pattern. We say this many calls, that many rows, and spacing, and we center it. Also, the very back one does not need the mouse at all. So um, sometimes if you say no mouse, it means it turns off any rollover information, any, anything like that. So it um, helps out uh, in performance. So we've made that big tile, and we said, hey, we're not going to mouse on that. We store it on the view so that we can access it from the controller later. Now, what is make pattern? So normally a tile just makes something like uh, a new circle. Um, I don't know what dimension we might need here, 40, something like that. So if that were the case, and we save this up and view our tile, refresh here, this is what we get. Grava. Boop. Okay, we just tiled a new circle right here. But if you want to tile something different, you can put in random colors, blue, green, for instance. That will randomly put blue and green. You could put in uh, a series there, blue, green. That will give us blue and green circles. 
in series like that. You can also pass in a function. What was that? Make no. make pattern. So here we're going to call uh, pass in a function. Or, where was it operating there? Uh, oh, instead of the whole new circle, make pattern like that. Okay, so there we are making a pattern each time. So each time it comes in here. Now remember that tile numbers is zero. Anytime we make a new tile, we make sure to set tile number zero, which means probably we didn't have to say it was zero here because we do it down below, but we could probably say null there. Uh, whatever. Zero is fine. It's just getting overwritten anyway. So we're going to get our data. We're looking at our data for the current page. So this is our current page. Rows and calls. So how many rows and calls are they there? Uh, oh, that's the current page times the rows and calls. So think about it. If our current page is zero, then in the data, all this would be zero, and we'd just be getting the tile num. So the data at the tile num. Very first tile would be zero. One, two, three, four, five, six, etc. But if we're on the second page, page num, well, instead of page num zero, it would be page num one. Then it would be one times the rows and columns. So in our data, rows and columns 16 times nine plus zero for the first tile num, zero. So we're getting the data after all of the data for the first um, page, because we're now on not page zero, we're on page one, <laughs> okay, page two, etc. So anyway, this is a way that we can get the data for our current page, which is important. If the data is a space, then we're going to just make a new container. There's that just. We're making a new container with the right size. If we don't do that, then when we go to tile it, it might get messed up because tile might say, oh, this has no space here. Therefore, I'm going to consider this column has you know no space. <laughs> and then we get columns mixed up. So we have to put in something in the tile that's the proper size. That's just the radius of the circle times two. Otherwise, um, we're going to return a clone of patterns. Now, let's see. What if D at S return? Oh, we're returning that. Good. Returning a new container. Otherwise, we're going to return uh, the patterns at the data at zero. OK, so this is the data that we're getting. The data has two parts to it. Remember, it has uh, a number, zero to nine and it has the rotation. So D at zero is the number. So patterns at zero, if we take a look, patterns is right here. Note where we get patterns from, from the view. This is why, it, oh, we're in the view. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> no, where we get patterns from, right here, uh, right above, okay. Uh, later on in the controller, we might need those patterns again. That's why I was <laughs> saying that. Because in the controller, we have to make copies of these things. And uh, I'm, I'm not sure anyway. I think we need patterns in the controller. But anyway, we, we grab the patterns. We clone it. Uh, that's an important thing as well. Because if we didn't clone it, we would end up potentially uh, using, oh, you know what? I think unless we say cloning off here in the tile, I think it'll automatically clone it. Can't remember. We might have to clone it there. Maybe we don't. I'm not sure because this, this uh, the tile is going to do the cloning, but the function returns that result. Uh, I think we probably don't have to clone it. Let's try that out because it would actually um, increase performance, I suppose, by a little bit if we didn't clone it. Let's try it. See if it works still. Over here, refresh. Boop. That seems all right, doesn't it? Show the same thing. Yeah, so I think we're good without uh, cloning it. Yeah. All right, for Zim Explorer, nice. And then we're rotating it based on the data of the of the rotation. And okay, this was the data of which pattern. This is the data of rotation. You know what? It has been an hour. We saw us making the tile there. 
Is there anything else in the controller when we, oh, there's all sorts, <laughs> all sorts of fun things here. We could do a part two. Do you want to do a part two? Heck, may as well, I guess. Uh, you're going, no, we thought it was only going to be an hour. Yeah, well, it is a whole app. You know, some people take months to make an app like this with Zim and our systems that we put in here. We took a week. And uh, that's pretty good, hopefully. This has been bum 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 Woohoo! Uh, hang on, did we get the Zim Explorer? <laughs> there we go, the Zim Explorer. Ah, uh, it's been a while since I've done an Explorer. Happy, happy holidays. Welcome back. Welcome to January. Welcome to snow if you're in Canada. Uh, I am Dr. Abstract. Please come and visit us at zimjazz.com and you can uh, ask any questions there, like I said. Uh, that, that. Do we even know where this was located? It's zimjs.com slash grava, G-R-A-V-A. We'll be launching, we'll be launching it shortly. All the best.